Okay, good day everybody. Welcome at Fiona's once again. I have the Villiers with me. This wasn't actually planned. He just got into the room about 10 minutes ago to come listen to my session and I'm like, hey, join me. Yeah. So I hope you're ready. <laughs> well, we'll see. Thank you guys. This is going to be an amazing message. I know that because it's normally when, when we just try to get things to flow that it will do well. So if you haven't listened to our previous message on gut feeling and God speaking, is your gut feeling God speaking? Um, please go listen to that message. That will be amazing. And then if you want to help us take this ministry forward, you are a good child of God. Thank you so much. <laughs> so there are a few things that you can do. And, <clears throat> you know, when you build God's kingdom, God will repay you. God will bless you. God will be good to you. So um, if you want to help us build, please send this message to somebody or to a few thousand people. <laughs> if you can do that, please subscribe to our channel. Please hit the bell. And leave some comments, leave some questions. That will be very, very great. And if you want to contribute financially, our banking details will be on the screen. Your financial contribution really helps us a lot. It helps us to keep going. And we know, again, if you sow into our lives, um, we know God will be good to you because of that. Not because I'm trying to manipulate you, but because I know the word says that. So um, thank you so much. De Villiers, are you ready? We'll find out as okay. soon as you begin. As soon as I begin. So this evening I want to I wanna have this conversation about religious but godless. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. um, religious is kind of let me read a scripture. And this is and this is my you know definition. Second okay. Timothy three verse five. The Bible says I believe it's Second Timothy three verse five, where the where the Bible says they have a form of godliness but denying its power. Or we can say it like this, they have religious acts, but there's no influence, there's no effectiveness because of it. Am I the right scripture? Having a form of God, yes. Okay, so Second Timothy 3 verse 5, will you quickly read it out loud? Okay. Or do I quote it like perfect? <clears throat> Having a form of godliness, but denying its power, have nothing to do with those people. Great. So... <clears throat> Having a form of godliness but denying its power. Remember, when you walk with God, when you walk with the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God empowers you. And I think one of the greatest ways where you can, where we can see the Spirit of God working, or we, or where we can see a relationship with God is working, is when you go through a bad time. I, I, I think this is a very weird place now to say it, but you know that's where you can actually separate religion from relationship, religion from you know following mere morals and mere rules to. Mm -hmm. um, to somebody actually walking with God and somebody actually putting their trust and their faith in their relationship with Jesus Christ. Sorry, you must interrupt me. I'm going to speak a lot. Mark chapter 7. When they came from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other things which they have received and, and hold, like the washing of cups, pitchers, uh, copper vessels, and couches. Is that couches? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> then the Pharisees and scribes asked him. So the Pharisees and scribes are doing all these religious rituals. And they asked him, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? So they come and they ask Jesus this question, you know, why are you doing, why, why, why aren't your disciples following the rules and the traditions the way we do? And this is what Jesus said. Jesus answered them. Well, did Isaiah prophesy of you, you hypocrites, as it is written, the people honor me with their lips, but their hearts, their heart is far from me, and in vain they worship me, teaching the doctrines and commandments of men, for laying aside the commandments of God, you hold the tradition of men, the washing of pitchers and cups, and many other such things you do. And in verse 30, the Bible says, making the word of God of no effect. Through your tradition which you have handed down and many such things you do. And you know what's the interesting thing here? God is not saying that, or Jesus is not saying, well, Jesus is God. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> we are in front of, front of a live audience. Audience. I don't know why I said it like that. You know. Why, why? Audience. Audience. <laughs> um, where was I in this in this in this Apparently session? Apparently in America. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa! Okay, so um, 
<laughs> holding, the, making the word of God of no effect by following the traditions. Yeah. Do you know what's very interesting here, De Villiers? That I'm not for sin, I'm not promoting sin, but it's not saying sin makes the word of God of no effect. Yeah. What he is saying, look how excited he gets. What he is saying, <laughs> he says your traditions are making the word of God of no effect. These yes. people that he was talking about were religious. Mm. But they were godless. Yes. Are you prepared now? Can we yes, talk yes. about this? Okay. So I actually have a, a good example of this. So we were on an outreach and there was this religious leader of a church, Katman. And what he did was he stopped us from being able to reach out to these students. And we had I just I was just like flowing. I just wanted to reach these kids and we were begging this church leader to just open the door for us to be able to speak to the kids and he just kept stopping us and the more we gave him bible the harder his heart became and while we were doing this i was reminded of this verse where it says by their traditions they nullify the word of god you can quote sure. scripture to a religious person and nothing's going to happen yeah. it's because the power of the Word of God is nullified. In other words, it's made void. Yeah. It's just a text then. Then it's just reading words on a scripture. Yeah. That person was probably educated in the Bible to the point where it became an academic study rather than the Word yeah. of God. So in order to, to get him to open the door, we had to give psychological facts on why these people need to hear what we need to say. And ultimately what opened the door for us was not the Bible, which is actually scary, but it was just grinding him down with, with psychological facts. But <laughs> That's how should... I got him to do this. <laughs> <laughs> we should never get to that point where we are a stumbling block to other people and we stand on our little hill mm. of our interpretation of the Word of God, but there's, it lacks the substance, the realness, yeah. and tradition does that. And the thing about tradition, that word for tradition there, it's, it's what you were raised into, what you see as normal. I mean, many people go to church, they, they were raised as kids in church. I know Albert wasn't, or maybe they, they tried, but he didn't go to church. Not that much. <laughs> Whereas I was... Some days were my off day. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was uh, brought up in church and my parents were always very intentional in raising me in the presence of God. But although that's a good thing, that also became a stumbling block in I was used to it. I got used to it. So when someone would say something, I would quickly put on my religious little mask. And the actual like power of the Word of God was lost because I already knew how to, to put on a mask. As soon, you know, it's like that voice changes. As soon as someone would say something from the Bible, like, yeah, yeah, and, and, you, and you just become, you know, like sober-minded and everything. But it's as if your life is over here, and then on Sundays you're over here. You just like swap your behavior a little bit to fit in. Mm -hmm. it, it becomes so part of you that the reality of the Word of God just like, it yeah. goes over your head. It's very, very good. And, uh, you know, oh, there's a lot of things that I'm thinking about now. And um, one thing that I, th I think you know dates more um, in the Bible more than I do. But <laughs> maybe not. Let's, let's see what happens. Like, he, he just got it, like I asked him a few minutes ago. But if you look at the book of Acts, I think the book of Acts happened kind of like at about 40 AD. Or am I... Yes or no, you don't know. Well, the first chapter like, happened right after Jesus died. So. Okay, right after Jesus died. But the point I'm trying to make is I think the physical Bible that we have today only came out 700 AD. 370. 370 AD. The point I'm trying to make is the book of Acts, the, the stories in the book of Acts happened way before the actual Bible came out. Yeah. So people... The, and the people in the book of Acts, they changed the world. They drove out demons. They prayed for the sick. They, they, they actually did what Jesus did on earth. Yes. And it was people. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't Jesus. It was people filled by the Holy Spirit. And they changed the, the world. And they didn't have the scriptures yet. Mm. And I just want to say the scripture is important. The Bible says, Romans 10 verse 17, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. But, you know, scripture 
without the person of Jesus, without the Holy Spirit, without relationship, without revelation, yeah. is, 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 is null and void. It's not, it's not going to help you. And it's, and it's a funny thing to say, it to, mm. to read the Bible, to go to church, to, you know, to do all of your religious acts without walking with Christ. Is, is powerless. The Bible says in 2 Chronicles 26, it speaks about this king called Uzziah. And I, and I know the book of Isaiah says, when King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. Yeah. So the King Uzziah in you has to die before you to walk with God. And King Uzziah was a guy, the Bible says, as long as he sought the Lord, the Lord made him to prosper. But later he got pride, and because of pride, he started to do things his own way. So he wasn't seeking a relationship with God anymore. He was, he was doing things his own way. He went back into religion and tradition mm. and pride in his own way of doing things. And what Isaiah is trying to tell us is if, if that thing in you doesn't die, if the King Uzziah in you that's trying to do things your way, your religion, your tradition, if that thing doesn't die, you cannot, you cannot walk with God. And if you look at the New Testament, if you look at the, if you, if you look at the Gospels, almost said the Beatitudes, if you look at the Gospels, you will, you will see this is the thing that Jesus attacked more than anything, is this yeah. kind of like this religion and tradition without walking with God. Yeah. When we say that that verse with, where, where God spoke to Isaiah and said, in the year King Uzziah died, mm -hmm. then God spoke to Isaiah in a way that was countercultural. It was against the norms of the day. I mean, Isaiah was not liked by the, by the kings and the religious leaders of his day. Jesus was not liked by the kings and the religious leaders of his day. Yeah. So it was actually the sinners liked him more than the religious people. So when we speak about religion, and I think Malcolm Smith says it like this, as soon as you say the word holy, everyone gets this funeral mood. <laughs> but that's not how it's supposed to be. When, um, when Jesus revealed himself it was at a, a wedding a celebration there was wine and dancing, dancing. <laughs> they would dance for days it was a week celebration and that's where god reveals himself and they didn't even have pre-workout or bcaa crash at that time <laughs> to like get the muscles going <laughs> <laughs> Jesus turned the water into pre-workout. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm I'm I'll having, be there for you. <laughs> I'm having trouble finding this nonsense in my Bible, Albert. No, um... <laughs> Revelation. <laughs> there is, a, the, as we say, the, the, there's a Greek word logos, which means word. And in the beginning was the Word. The yeah. Word was with God. The Word was God. John 1. Mm. But that does not mean the written down Word necessarily. As we said, the Bible only came in a few hundred years after the church was already flourishing. No. What happened before then was Jesus. You speak about Jesus. Mm. Everything in the Bible is true because it speaks about Jesus. Yeah, good. Not the other way around. Yeah, it's good. We learn the Word of God through knowing the Logos, the person that was there before yeah. everything else was created. And then we have another Greek word for word, which is rhema, the revealed word of God, the manifested, the, 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 the vision word of God that just makes sense all of a sudden. Mm. And that is what we live by. We don't live by quoting the Bible out of our heads. And I know many people, even if no one ever preaches the word to them and they get a Bible, many people have gotten saved just by reading mm -hmm. what's in the Bible. But it's not the Bible that saved them. It was what the Bible was talking about, the Jesus within right. the pages. It wasn't the pages. Yeah. We need to, to reevaluate what do we base our faith on. Albert once sent me a sermon. I did. <laughs> I, I don't remember who was speaking. But he said, if you ask a Christian, what do you base your faith on? 80% of the time people will say the Bible. But that's not actually what it's supposed to be. Mm. We should say the resurrection of Jesus Christ. For sure. Because, as Paul said, if Jesus wasn't risen, then all of our preaching would be in vain. Yeah. Then everything that I wrote down, Paul, mm. would be in vain. <laughs> I actually, like, you know how many people ask me questions today? Uh, a lot. <laughs> but um, you know how many times do I, do I answer with, like, how does that help us? <laughs> yeah. To know that, how this, like, people, people will ask me, okay, millions of years ago, did dinosaurs exist? Well, what if they did, or what if they didn't? 
Yeah. You know, because our faith is not based on that. Yeah. Our faith is not based on, you know, how old how old everything is. Yeah. Because people are actually fighting about that, and people are actually dividing churches about it. Literally about how long have yeah. we been? It's doing there. a lot of damage to the. <laughs> yeah. And but the thing is, our faith is not in that. Our faith is in the birth, the death, the resurrection, and the ascension of Jesus Christ. Yes. That is that is what we actually base our faith on, and that is where we should get together. And that is where the power is. Mm. You know, not in not in like people. People will ask me the question, like you know, the Bible says this guy lived eight hundred and so many years. W- w- were those actual years like today? What does it matter? He was old. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. People make when you when you start losing the spirit mm. that you are pursuing when you are, when you start pursuing the academics mm. and not the person. That's good. Yeah. Those things start becoming important. Mm. You start tripping over a little rock, mm. whereas you're supposed to be moving towards a more intimate relationship with God. Yeah. And I'm not saying don't ask questions yeah ask questions it's fine but whether a dinosaur existed whether it didn't doesn't influence how awesome god is yeah and it shouldn't influence how i love him yeah and at the end of the day what is the gospel the gospel is not the bible it the 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 the, the bible speaks about the gospel and the gospel is that which Jesus already did for us. Yeah, that's good. Mm. Yeah, so, the, and, and I want to bring it back to this. Um, do, we, do we still have power? And I think that's the thing that can, that, that, that can lack a lot. To say, listen, but we have knowledge, we have discussions, but we, 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 we're not at a place mm. where, we, where, we, where we have power anymore. So we have to move from discussion, information, to a place where we can have influence and effectiveness. Yeah. Because the Bible, the Bible does say you shall be known by your fruit. You shall be known by actually what naturally comes out of you. Mm-hmm. And if we look at fruit, love, joy, peace, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, long suffering, self control, all of those things, even self control. If you think about self, if you tell somebody self control, what they think is I have to control me, I have to mm-hmm. I have to control my addiction, I have to but the Bible doesn't say addiction control, it, it says self control, but self control is a fruit. Mm. A fruit is not produced out of effort. Yeah. If you if you, if you think about it that way, a, a fruit is produced naturally. So the Bible says when you walk with God, you start to produce things naturally. What the Bible says you can produce, you now start to produce naturally. So the Bible actually explains to you what you can produce and what you can become and what you can do if you walk with Christ. Yeah. But the Bible doesn't produce that. Christ produces that. The Bible just speaks about what Christ can produce, but if, mm-hmm. but if you put your faith in your knowledge, yeah. if you put your faith in your degree, if you put your faith in your religion, in your tradition, in your way of doing things, then it becomes a problem. Because, sorry, I'm talking a lot now, I'm going to give you a chance now, but the Bible says there was a time in the Bible where, where religious preachers and teachers came into the synagogue to be healed by Jesus. Yeah. So they went to be healed. And the Bible says... Jesus went and the power of God was there to heal them. Yes. So they went to receive healing. Jesus actually went to heal them with the power of God and none of them got healed. Can you believe this? People go to Jesus to be healed. Jesus laying hands on people, praying for them, and nobody gets healed. Sure. <laughs> right? And the Bible says what happens is, 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 is one person got healed. And this is a person who actually made a hole in the roof like with with his friends. And this person was a sinner. And the Bible says Jesus looked at the sinner. He said to him, your sins are forgiven. You stand up and walk. And that that was the only guy. Can you believe the only guy that got healed was the sinner? The preachers and teachers didn't get healed. And this is why the sinner came with, you know, I have nothing to stand on. I I have no good works. I'm a sinner. If he heals me, it's only by his grace, it's only by his power. Yeah. Where the religious preachers and teachers came and they said, I did this right, I did this right, I kept this commandment, I did this right, and that's why he should heal me. And that's why the word of God was nullified. Mm. Because they put their faith and they put their, 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 their trust, ability yeah. to get healed, their trust to get healed in their knowledge, in their religion, in their good works, in the fact that they were preachers and teachers. Yeah. And the word of God had no power. But yeah. there's one guy who said, listen, I have nothing to stand on. Like, if he heals me, it's only by his grace. Yeah. That guy got healed. 
And you know? that's where the power actually worked. Yes. I think one thing that, that you're touching on there, religious people, and and I say this as well, you don't, we're not speaking about this so that you can go and identify religious people in your world. <laughs> <laughs> we, we're speaking about this so that you can identify that thing in yourself yeah. and sort it out. Uh, because each and every one of us, if you've been safe for long enough, you're going to start being that. We did a, a series on uh, the prodigal son. He did a series on it. I wasn't there. Mm. <laughs> you were there, but you were, yeah. But we spoke about the, the older brother. I'll be there. I was taking singing lessons in the title. It didn't. <laughs> but um, that's why we don't have Theonosis in a singing channel yet. Thank God. But um, what we were speaking about is how each person has that little religiousness on the inside of them and that comes from a place of insecurity mm -hmm. it comes from a place of you prayed and you didn't get the promotion oh i didn't pray enough yeah or i didn't do this enough or i i, I didn't work hard enough and as soon as you're in that place religion kind of is the making sense it's the comforting where it's the natural yeah. thing where, where you fall back on. Yeah. The Bible in Genesis speaks about leaves. Yes, yeah. fig leaves. Fig leaves, yeah. So when, when Adam and Eve sinned, they were immediately aware of their nakedness. And we speak on a spiritual nakedness, you, you know I'm not enough. Mm. And they immediately went and made a covering for themselves with fig leaves. Mm. But that was not enough. Yeah. You'll see that God came and He saw through the fig leaves and He made a plan. He created the first clothes from the skins of animals for them. In other words, not even that which they put on to cover themselves was good yeah. enough. Yeah, yeah. And that's what religion is. It's the effort to cover yeah. your weaknesses. Mm. Um, you know, very interesting. Remember in the Bible when the Pharisees brought the woman caught in the act of adultery and they threw him through her at the feet of Jesus and Jesus went down to her level and wrote on the ground we don't know what he wrote but it was for her mm -hmm. and then the Greek says Jesus stood up and said um, he didn't say you who are without sin cast the first stone he said you who are without this sin cast the first stone so he was calling out the Pharisees and saying yalla no Lacquer. <laughs> and that is very interesting because the Pharisees were the religious people of their day. We sneer at the Pharisees like they would sneer at sinners, but they were the super religious people like we are ourselves sometimes. And they would expose the sin of someone else to feel better about themselves. Yeah. When someone like that is, goes into the presence of God, Jesus says they would pray a prayer like, Thank you that I'm a Pharisee. Thank you that I am not like other men. That I'm not like this sinful tax collector next to me. And the, it's almost like the entirety of their confidence before God is that they are not as bad as other people. Oh, that's good. So, oh, I might drink, but at least I, I don't do that. Or I know I've got this issue, but at least I don't do drugs. Or, and it's almost as if they justify themselves by what they don't do, yeah. rather than their relationship with yeah. God. So the Bible says in Ephesians two verse eight to ten, um, "For by grace you have been saved through faith; that not of yourself, it is a gift of God." Now I just want to say this: salvation is not just when you get born again. You can be born again, but you need, to, you need to be saved out of certain situations. You need to be saved out of your addiction. You have to be saved out of your worry. And, and the same Christ that got you saved when you, were, when you were a sinner and you needed salvation, it's the same Christ who saves you. It's the same power of God. It's the same grace that saves you. Yeah. So it's not like, you know, we get saved by grace, but now by works we have to endure. Mm -hmm. You get saved by grace and you walk by grace. Grace is the thing that keeps you. Not of works, verse 9 says, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that you should walk in them. So what he's basically saying 
It's the salvation power. It's the power of the grace of God in you. Mm. That first, that saves you. And then that same grace, that same spirit causes you to be his workmanship. Yes. And to do. So you don't do out of your, I'm going to say this, out of your discipline. You know, because so many times as Christians, Pastor Judah Smith said this. He said, if we teach people how to be more disciplined, how to be, how to be better, how to work harder and how to do better. If we teach people that, how is the gospel any different than what our football coaches taught us? Sure. <laughs> you know, the gospel should be different. The gospel is, it's not by your works. It's not by your discipline. By that, the gospel is not saying don't work. It's not saying don't be disciplined. What it is saying, it's not because you work that God is good for you. Mm. It's not because you are disciplined that God is good for you. But God is good for you. God's grace works in you. And because of that, you can work. Because of that, you can be disciplined. Yeah. Because of that, you can have self-control. It's a fruit. Mm. It's not of yourself. Did you play football? No, that's what, like, like Judah Smith is from America. So he used the example. I was quoting him. Oh, of course. <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> Trying to catch you. Buy a donkey. Buy a donkey. Okay. And and some of those works that we were speaking of, that stuff you do, they are good things. And religious things, sometimes they are actually good ideas. You know, pray, read your Bible, pray every day, whatever. It's a good idea. Watching a Theonos video, it's great. I'm not going to get you saved. Well, but it's going to get you calm. <laughs> <laughs> so it's... A lot of these things are brilliant ideas and you should do them, but the motive behind them should not be to sustain your salvation because it can't sustain your salvation. Nothing but the blood of Jesus can save you. Yeah, it's good. And by the blood of Jesus, you stay saved. The, the good work that God started in you, he will, he will complete. Yeah. That which we build ourselves on, shouldn't be our deeds it should be what he has already done for us Amen. when we realize more and more what he did those things will start to make sense like let's talk about communion a lot of people have this big issue with communion um i forgot what the big word is but there is there was a schism in churches schism is a big word no it's like, not that big <laughs> It's just, <laughs> it just means, you know, to tear apart. Like a thing this. <laughs> but, so some people believe when you eat the communion, the bread physically turns into the body of Christ. Like physically in your body. Is it transmutation? Anyway. Um, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> and then the, the wine literally changes into the blood of Christ in your body. So there's like physical meat in you. And some people say, no, it's just metaphorical. But whatever it is, that is not what matters. And that's and religious people like getting stuck in Facebook comments. <laughs> How many times I would make a Facebook status like anger. And then the Holy Spirit would be like, who are you helping? Face your problems. <laughs> <laughs> or I would type this long, very loving Facebook a comment on someone's very unloving <laughs> post and then the Holy Spirit would interrupt me and say yeah just don't no 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 and it's like a natural part of us that we want to debate we want to fight we yeah. want to because it justifies us yeah. it makes us feel better and that's the religious part of us that that takes the bait yeah. the religious part of us wants to prove our godliness that's good. If you want to prove your godliness, you're already in that red zone. Sure. Okay. Really good. Let, let, let's just give that five cents yeah. out there. Cool. So, as I was saying, in Colossians 2 verse 17, you have to understand that there were people arguing with Paul or with the people in the church of Colossia. Colossia. <laughs> Colossia. <laughs> However you would wish to say it. <laughs> That's a very religious thing to do, Albert. I, I hope you are going to listen to the message afterwards. But um, in Colossia, Colossia, <laughs> people were arguing, doing this is right, doing this is wrong. No, you may not drink alcohol. Yes, you have to drink alcohol. No, you are not allowed to 
make a meal on the Sabbath day, or yes, you should, or no, you're not allowed to um, eat without washing your hands. It's a good idea to wash your hands. Or whatever. They had a lot of laws and they were arguing amongst themselves, what should we do? The Bible says that the seventh day is the Lord's. And then other people say, yes, but this is the New Testament. And arguing, arguing, arguing. And Paul says something very important that I think most of us have forgotten. Colossians 2 verse 17. These things are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Now the Greek there says the body, the substance, is found in Christ. Those things were only pictures. They were only metaphors of the reality. And the reality is Christ. So we can talk about communion. We can talk about baptism. And these things are important. But we do not base our faith on those things. We base our faith on Christ. Mm -hmm. You can be baptized as a baby and as an adult and just before you die and still not know Christ. Mm -hmm. That's not what matters. You need to know Christ. If we have the substance, if we have the body, if we have Christ, we have the real thing. Mm -hmm. Religion makes the other things important. Then we start looking at the, the details. We, we are so worried about the details. Um, yesterday I spoke to a guy and he said the most amazing thing. He says, it's as if we believe God's will is a tightrope and we have to do a lot of effort to keep walking on that tightrope, otherwise we will fall. But that's not how God's will works. Mm -hmm. Jesus died for us. We are not walking on a tightrope. We are walking with Him. Yeah. The, the picture of the walk with Christ is one of maturity, one of, at the end of the day, suffering a lot of the time, but it's not one of fame and fortune and people looking at you and thinking, that is what God looks like. No. It's going where Jesus would go. Yeah. People usually say, what would Jesus do? That little armband thing and someone wants to tell them, that's, that's a bad idea. Now wear a little, what would Jesus do? So what is he doing in this situation and what should I do? Yeah, that's good. It's not a must, but it's who you really are. It's very good. Yeah. And we were speaking about love and how Jesus were, you know, if we, we literally today break relationships because of arguments in Scripture, we break, we split churches because of, because of scriptural arguments. Yeah. Let's just quickly look at how Jesus handled something. And this is going to shock you. If you look at John 13, you get this big scene. And this, and this is kind of like, it, they, they, they call this chapter the chapter where Jesus identifies his betrayer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it starts off the scene where the, where, where, the, where the disciples are kind of fighting one another about who's the best. Yeah. And then Jesus just starts washing their feet. Now you guys know the story. Peter gets overexcited. He wants his whole body washed. Jesus is telling him to calm down. And you can explain now what the washing of the feet means. But then after that, you, you get the story of where Jesus identifies his betrayer. Mm -hmm. And the Bible says what he did is he actually told John, I'm going to dip the bread and I'm going to give it to the person. The person that I give it to, that's my betrayer. So he gives it to Judas. And this whole scene is where all the disciples see now, you know, Judas is the one going to betray Jesus. <laughs> so here Judas goes. And I want you to see how Jesus handles the situation. Judas goes. Everybody knows where Judas is going. They know Judas is going now to betray Jesus to be crucified. And look at how Jesus handles the situation. He calls them together and in verse 34 he says the following, a new commandment I give to you. Now let me just say this. No human being can just add or subtract to God's commandments. Yeah. So either Jesus is like totally blasphemous or is really the son of God. Yeah. So the Bible says Jesus is speaking and he says a new commandment I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you that you should also love one another. Now I'm, I'm writing so I have somebody that edits my book and somebody that proofreads my book and the person that proofreads my book recently told me and God bless her soul and I think she gave me the right advice she said that don't use the same word too much in the one paragraph. <laughs> right. <laughs> Would it need to me? Yeah. Let me just tell. Let me just show you how Jesus is right. <laughs> a new like this is one verse. He says, "A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, 
as I have loved you, so you should love one another. You know what he's, you know what you know what I would have done? You know what me, what I would have done if Judas did that, I would have called the eleven together. I would have said, listen, I knew it from the beginning, this God, this guy's heart, heart wasn't right from the beginning. You know, um, don't trust him. Please just stick with me. I have to go. Like, that's what I would have done. Not Jesus. Jesus is like, this guy's going away. You guys going to see him again. You know, the way you love one another, that's going to prove if you're really my disciple. Sure. <laughs> I'm like, whoa, wait. <laughs> you're teaching him to love him? That's your teaching? He's going to betray you and you teaching them that the way they love him? This is, this is on another level. Mm. We, we literally break relationships because of differences <clears throat> of doctrine. Jesus is saying, you know, love the guy who's about to betray me. Mm. That's on another level. Yeah. You need the power and the grace of God to do that. Yeah, on that note, that verse says, where Jesus says, a, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you. That is... Yeah. In the Greek, that's that's not even the past tense. That is, I have been loving you since forever. Yeah. That is, I have loved and I have been loving. Mm. So, in in the same love as you saying, without that revelation of God's love, we will not be able to love. Yeah, for sure. That's very very good. Uh, my pastor is here tonight, Pastor Gerard, um, just to see that I'm not messing up and eating too much afterwards. But he always teaches this. He always teaches self-love. That's yeah. like he 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 always say yeah. He always say to us like one thing that's lacking in teaching is self-love. You have to learn to love yourself. Love God. Love yourself. And then as you love yourself, you can love people. If you're struggling to love people, that's proof that you're not loving yourself. Yeah. Proof. If you yeah. if you if you want to ask yourself, do I really love myself? Go see if you love people. Yeah. If you're struggling to love people, am I right, Pastor Gerard? And he says, no. Cut, cut, cut. The video. Over yeah. over. <laughs> you guys, next week. <laughs> We're wrong about everything. We have to go to Matthew 16, 6 now. Are we going to do that? <laughs> yes, please. Do you want to go for it? Okay. So then Jesus said, <laughs> Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. I just want to say this before you carry on. The Pharisees and the Sadducees weren't bad people. They were keeping the law quite well, and he's going to explain it now. Jesus was hanging out with sinners. When we think sinners, we think people who swear too much and who drink too much. Jesus was kind of hanging out with pimps and prostitutes <laughs> and tax collectors. Like, like that's the reality. Those that's people the... that work at SARS. <laughs> We see you. Jesus loves you. Jesus was hanging out with a guy called Zacchaeus. You spoke about Zacchaeus before. Yes. But um but but yeah, let's let's speak about the scripture. I just wanted to say what kind of people Jesus actually hung out with. So so Jesus is speaking to to his disciples and he warns them about the leaven of the Sadducees and Pharisees. Now leaven is something I don't know anything about. Some people call it like um, yeast. Yeast, yes. Yeah. So yeast, it's if you do it. <laughs> <laughs> so, what does it do? What What does it do? Let, let's first think about what it means in the Bible. In the Bible, it was at Passover. You were not allowed to eat leavened bread. You had to eat unleavened bread. Passover was called the feast of the unleavened bread. So, what you start off with you you have the dough and if you don't add leaven to it it will not get bigger when you put it in the oven it will stay like flat it yeah. will stay flat it's not gonna change when it's put under pressure but yeast when you add that to the dough what happens is it expands and it becomes something else than what you started with and that is religion mm -hmm. the spirit of religion is that yeast it is when you are you end up with a form of godliness other than intended when you started it is when you got saved by grace through faith oh you had an amazing salvation story you have this amazing testimony ten years down the line you are judgmental mm -hmm. 
of the person that just got saved because you know their story. That person did this, that person did this. And that is because that yeast got a hold of you and it works silently. You don't see it. It's not over a few seconds and in your life it's not overnight that you are suddenly religious. It's in a little part of you that that was insecure that you had to prove yourself and you started doing well and you you've been you didn't miss a church service for five years you was you've not missed tithing for three years or whatever but it, it, it can be like that little pride that little King Uzziah getting alive and well on the inside of you and before you know it you end up so far removed from the grace of God mm. That you are still doing the things of God without having any intimacy with the God of those things. Yeah. It's almost like a, how did Jesus spoke about the Pharisees. He would speak about them as sinners. He didn't speak about sinners as sinners. I say this very often. But when Jesus dealt with Pharisees, he dealt with them in a way that they would be dealing with themselves if they didn't do all those nice things. Mm. He would reveal their pain and their weakness. He would like bring it to the surface so that they could see how broken they are. Mm. Because Jesus said, I came for the um, lost sheep of the house of Israel. Th that too. But I didn't come for those who are healthy. I came for those who are sick. And obviously everyone in that context is sick. Everyone is sinful. All have fallen short of the glory of God. But Jesus was saying, I'm not going to come and tell the Pharisees, you guys, you can just come to me, it's fine. They first need to admit that they need God. They need to first see how sick they really are before they can actually accept, but grace is enough. Yeah, it's good. Um, the answer for the older brother and the younger brother is the same. It's the arms of the father. Mm. Unless you are actively looking for God's embrace, you will always fall back into religion. Yeah, it's very good. And if you, if we can just go back, and I think we're going to finish with this almost. This is, we, we started that scripture in Mark chapter 7, verse 13, that says you make the word of God of no effect by following yeah. your religion and traditions. Now listen to what Galatians 5, verse 4 says. If you ever wondered, can a person fall from grace? Can you get to that place where you fall from grace, where grace doesn't work? Listen to what the Bible says in Galatians 5, verse 4. And um, the, 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 the background of Galatians is people who kind of like they started out in grace, but later they wanted to bring their religion and their tradition and their laws in. Yeah. Am I correct? Yeah. Okay. So, um, and this is the church that actually Paul wrote to them. This is the church he spoke harshest to, or one of the churches he spoke harshest to, not, or not, if not the harshest. Yeah. Okay. So I'm just checking if he knows his Bible. So um, he, he actually says to this church, now listen to what happened. They, they started off in grace, but because they wanted to please the people who were religious, they brought in religious laws and they kind of had this mixture between the grace of God and their religious law. And Paul wrote to them, he said to them, who has bewitched you? And he said, you who have started, you who have seen Christ crucified, you started in grace. Mm. But now you brought in your religion. Listen to what he says in Galatians 5 verse 4. He, said, he says, You have become estranged from Christ. You who attempt to be justified by the law, you have fallen from grace. So he says, You who are try, you who are trying to justify yourself by your law. It's you who become estranged from Christ. It's you who the grace of God doesn't work with anymore. Again, it's that form of godliness without having any power. But here's the thing. If Christ touches you, the grace of God takes you to another level. You start to influence people to another level. You start to gift at another level. You start to love people at another, at another level. Why? Because now something supernatural is taking over. You, you, you don't do it in your strength mm -hmm. anymore. I also think it's Malcolm Smith that said this, that said, um, we are so afraid to say we are weak. Mm -hmm. But Christ actually works when we can admit we are weak. When we mm -hmm. can admit we cannot. And that's when He actually works through us. Yes. I think it's also very important to say that, let's say things are not going well. Let's say you have messed up and you did sin. We're not saying you're not saved. <laughs> People make mistakes and we are still human beings. We grow in Christ. That doesn't mean everything's always going to go well for us. Yeah. 
if you read the Bible, sometimes that it, it, it was the opposite. Mm. You, you follow Christ and they kill your family, they kill you. But growing in Christ, being not religious, it's not about seeing this visible growth. Mm. It's about intimacy with God. Yeah. When you are intimate with God and, and, you, and, you are the, and you allow yourself to be the object of His love, these things will come. Seek first the kingdom and these things will be added. But you cannot say, okay, I sinned now, that means I'm being religious and that, that, that's still a religious mindset. Yeah. Religion is not what you call it. Yeast of the Pharisees is anything that's keeping you from intimacy with God. No. It's like you, you're a little worm coming into the presence of God begging for forgiveness. Malcolm Smith says it's like on every Sunday you, you have to cry yourself into salvation and then Monday you're fine, Tuesday you're great, Wednesday you're losing a bit of momentum, Thursday you slip up, Friday you've backslidden, Saturday you, Sabbath day. you, you just lost and Sunday oh it's the tears again and you cry enough for God to love you, mm. Monday you're strong again. Mm. That, that is a cycle, that's a religious cycle. Mm. And that's not how salvation works. Yeah. You don't have to, as he says, rededicate your dedication. Mm. You do, you're not saved by your dedication to Christ. You are saved by His dedication to you. Yeah. By the finished work of the cross. And as soon as you realize that the work needed for you to be okay, to be acceptable to God, is done. You can just be. And that loving relationship is what's going to cause the real change in your life. That's very good. Um, I want to end with this story. Uh, Cain and Abel in Genesis 4. Okay. Let's just go to Genesis 5 quickly. Verse 24, the Bible says, And Enoch walked with, walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. So this was quite in the beginning, you know, um, and, 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 and this guy, this guy didn't even know have what we have to had what he what we have today. We have we have the Bible, we have the Holy Spirit, but this guy walked with God in such a way that God just took him. That's like a, a, a picture of a long ago rapture, if we can if we can say if we can say it like that. <laughs> but I just want to go to the story of Cain and Abel because the story of Cain and Abel is so interesting to me. Because here you get two people who grew up in the same house with the same parents with the same rules. The one guy, um, Abel, gave God the offering that God asked for, meaning he could be obedient to God, he gave God what God wanted. The other guy, Cain, also gave an offering, but he gave what he thought was right. And the Bible says God accepted Abel's offering, but he didn't accept Cain's offering. Mm -hmm. And for me, this is a picture of you know religion versus walking with God. Yeah. They grew up in the same house. Today we can say same church, same rules, same teaching, yeah. same everything. You know, you can you can you can preach to a bunch of people. Two people can come to you and say great message. The one person starts to contribute. They start to serve. They start to do something great. The other person just falls back. Same message, same environment, same everything. But the one really got touched, got touched by the grace of God. And the other one just did it out of religion. I, I'm just doing it because, you know, this is what religion taught me. And the other one does it. Abel does it because God really spoke mm -hmm. to him. And I want to end off and I want to pray for you guys. Before I do that, you want to say something? No, no, I think that's good. So I want to, I want to ask you this question because this is probably one of the most important messages that you can hear. That you don't get to that place where you do things out of religion. Yeah. You know, every single week when, when, when I speak, when I do this, I pray, I trust God, I ask the Lord. Because I don't want to do anything out of my own works. I don't want to do anything out of my own striving. And so many people are there today. So many people are actually, they, they, they don't trust God anymore. They don't serve God anymore. Mm -hmm. Because they, what, what religion does is it says... Religion, I explain it like this, religion is like seeing God as a genie in a bottle mm -hmm. or a genie in a lamp. When you rub the lamp, the genie, the genie comes out and he grants you a wish and you just say what you wish for and you get it. So when you get to that place where you do the right thing, you ask God, but God doesn't answer your prayer the way you want it to be answered, then you just like walk away. And that's what religion does. So 
But if you really have a relationship with God, you don't just thank God for the times He said yes. You thank God for the times He said no. So many of you listening now have prayed for things, and you can say, thank you, God, today that, that you didn't give that to me. Right? But we, but we kind of miss that, because that's what relationship is all about. Um, religion says, you know, just do the right thing, and God will be good to you. Religion says, if you do good, you will get good. If you do bad, you will get bad. So religion and karma basically teaches the same thing. <laughs> what Christianity teaches, what Christ teaches is you will get good that you don't deserve, although you were bad. Yeah. Because the one that was good received all your bad. Yeah. So we have to get to that place where we can say, listen, I walk with Christ. I will do what you want me to do. I will act when you want me to act. I will rest when you want me to rest. I will do all of these things. Because sometimes God will say rest. Yeah. You know, some people say, I'm not taking a day off, but because Satan never takes a day off. But God took a day off. I'm not following Satan. I'm following God. I'm not following Satan's example. Satan didn't take a day off. Great for you. God did. <laughs> right? Because sometimes, like, I know this, pre this one preacher, Mike Todd, he, he, he once told the story where God told him just to slow down a bit. Mm. Right? Because sometimes that's what God will say. Sometimes God will say, dude, you're too busy. Slow down a bit. Mm. Rest a bit. Spend time with me a bit. Yeah. Anyway, that was maybe for somebody. So if you're watching this message and you're saying, listen, I need to give my life back to the Lord Jesus Christ. I have to walk with him. I want to walk with him like Enoch walked with him, like Moses walked with him. If we look at the story of Moses, the story of Moses was not getting them out of Egypt to get them into Canaan. It was getting them out of Egypt to get them in a relationship with God. Yeah. The Bible says, God actually said to Moses, he said, go get my people that they can worship me in the wilderness. God wanted to see them face to face. It wasn't about a land. It wasn't about a promised land. It was about a promised sir. It wasn't about a place. It was about a person all along. And, and sometimes we miss that. Mm. But God wants to take you to him, not to a place. Mm. So if you are there and you say, listen, I've been caught up in religion. And re being caught up in religion is more dangerous than being caught up in sin. Yeah. And the reason I'm saying that is somebody that's caught up in sin knows they are wrong. And they know they need help. They know they need a savior. The problem with, re with religion is you think you're right. Yeah. There's, a, there's a verse that says there's a way that seems right to man. But the ways are still death. It, yeah. it, it, it ends up in death. Yeah. Spiritual death anyway. So you, you need to come to the, you need Jesus to knock you off of your donkey. Donkey. <laughs> so listen, um, some of the people, I'm going to say this, I'm going to make a weird statement now. Some of the people you have, you have to be mostly afraid, not afraid of, but mostly careful for, is people who think I know everything. That's dangerous. You have to be careful. <laughs> I know. <laughs> you know that. Exactly. <laughs> So if you're watching um, and you're saying, listen, that's me, I need to give my life back to Jesus Christ. I have to walk with him. Because when you die or when Jesus comes back, however you need to go to heaven, he's not going to ask you to quote Bible scriptures before you go into heaven. He's not going to look at your works. He's not going to look at your deeds. He's going to look at, do you have Christ? Yeah. You can, be, you can be a preacher and still don't have Christ. I know it's like kind of like weird to hear. Mm -hmm. No, it's true. Christ is the focus because I don't want to be religious but godless yeah because many people and this is what this whole talk is about many people were religious but godless yeah and the problem is they think they're okay yeah if that's you and you say listen I need to give my life back to Christ just either raise your hand or put your hand on your heart just as an indication just to say that's me I need to come back and then I'm gonna pray this prayer I want you to repeat after me say Lord Jesus I acknowledge that I cannot save myself I acknowledge my religion cannot save me. I need a savior. Lord Jesus, I invite you now to be my savior. I want to walk with you. I want to be with you. Thank you that I'm now saved by your grace in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for being on. I know this wasn't planned, but I think it was great. Thank you. It was nice yeah. being here. Thanks for forcing me to be on the show. Ah, it's my pleasure. Now you can get cheese that I the cheese that I promised. Thank you. Can you unlock me from my chains, please? <laughs> <laughs> Love you guys. I did that. I'll see you soon. And watch our previous video. Yes. Love you. Bye bye.